Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome along to our Insight Seminar for this week. Um, joining us, before we kick off, I will say, uh, first acknowledge our traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, with us today, we've got Associate Professor Jason Ferris from the University of Queensland with a presentation on nitrous oxide. Um, so for those joining us online, uh, we will take questions at the end. So if you just type those questions in the box as we go, we'll get to them uh, once we finish. But I'll hand it over to you, Jason. Thank you and good morning and hello to everyone online. I can't see you, which is fine. It doesn't make sense though, I should be able to see you. Um, and hello to everyone here I can see. Um, I'm going to talk about nitrous oxide um, a use. Uh, a lot of the data I'm going to present today comes from the Global Drug Survey uh, disclosure here. I'm the chief statistician or biostatistician for the Global Drug Survey. I've been working with Adam now since 2013. Um, uh, I might pitch it a number of times as we go through. I know Bayala is a big supporter of the Global Drug Survey, as long as uh, many other of the um, drug using units, uh, communities around Queensland and Australia, um, and um, notwithstanding myself. Um, one of the things about nitrous oxide as I get into, um, we'll talk about it's what is it, et cetera, but um, about the harms from using nitrous oxide. And these aren't harms that um, I typically think of are ones you need to be scared of, like when you're using too much cocaine or heroin or stuff like that. But it, they are harms that do play out. And they've been researched now for at least, or well, when I was doing some lit literature reviews from the early 1970s, when it was in public medical media, and I'll talk about this, about case reports of people back then still using up to 100 canisters a session. I'm going to talk about that today because we have these people in the Global Drug Survey as well. Um, we sort of think of nitrous oxide today as being something you do for a bit of a buzz, quite literally. That's what you get when you use it. Um, and most of the time it's uh, accompanying other fun activities that you're doing at the time. Um, but you'll find in here there are people out there who are using nitrous oxide. Um, I'll use the word heavily and I think this plays out. Um, in terms of what the harms from nitrous oxide can be. Um, so I'll look at my screen and I'll sort of look forward in here rather than turning around. I find myself doing this as a habit. Um, but look, nitrous oxide has many, many names like many, many other drugs uh, from last, laughing gas to hippie crack, a very UK one there. Whippets and Noz, um, Noz in particular and Nangs are, are very common in Australia as the expression or Pingers as well depending on what you want to do or Nitro if you're in the car scene. So it's the same gas at the end of the day um, and the Noz that they use in there is to make those cars go super fast if you're into fast and furious and you know number eight or number nine if it comes out you know always these cars when they take off nitrous oxides behind that. Um, uh, Joseph Priestley was a, um, a gentleman who decided to look into nitrous oxide in 1793. Um, the chemical formula is down the bottom. It's non-flammable, it's inorganic, it's used across many areas. We'll see this in a moment. Um, it's um, a pretty simple um, chemical that can be created and then nowadays we see it compressed and put into little canisters and other ones I'll show you as well. Um, so it's got multiple uses, right? Um, we've got a good um, audience participation of women here. I'm going to assume a number of you have had babies and maybe if you're lucky that you had some nitrous when you are in the uh, theatre. If your partners were with you, they might have been saying, can I have some of that? Um, I've had three kids. Um, each time nitrous has been in the room, each time my wife hasn't used it, each time I wanted to use it, but I felt I'll get in trouble every time I go grab the mask. So I still never used hospital grade nitrous in my life. Um, it's treated for burn victims. Um, it's uh, uh, well used, and I don't know if it's still uh, commonly used for kids in dentistry. This is often when you think about it being, um, well, how harmful can it be if the dentist is quite happy to give it to the kids to help with a filling, help with a tooth extraction, all those sorts of things. And the last image there is the nitrous in the car. Um, the, it's also used um, out for farming practices. So I've got the cows there. It's not that the cows ingest it, but it goes into the milk. 
Um, so they don't go out getting a buzz, you know, they sort of walk in at the end of the day, get on the mask while they're giving out some milk. It's, it's purely part of the milk process. Um, but it's gone from being this medical setting, treatment setting, uh, mechanical setting, to being a recreational space as well. Um, it's, it's incredible, the, uh, I guess, the impact on um, the communities at large with now uh, these pictures of canisters that I've seen from Twitter space and seen walking the streets. Um, used to come from Melbourne. One of my pastimes used to be walking down the laneways of Melbourne and looking for needles. Um, we got really good at doing it, seeing the needles that are scattered around, thinking we need to come up with a better system of removing the needles that are around. Nowadays I could remove my hobby to canisters. Um, I was just mentioning before that the Central Park in, so what, West End, what's the name of the park? Musgrave. Musgrave Park. Apparently now on the Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings they're beginning to become littered with canisters as well. So kids, someone are going out to the 7-Elevens, getting a late trade and then going sitting up under the trees and the, the canisters are appearing. Um, over in the festivals, especially across Europe, uh, the, the standard story is you finish your two day, three day, five day festival, you leave the exit gates and all the sellers are outside now selling you at the end of festival eee, while, while you're sort of coming down and waiting for an Uber or waiting for a bus, they're selling at the streets after festivals as well. And there's business to be made because then you get to lie around and do ballooning. Um, so this is having the balloons is the commonplace. And this is the main system that is being used across Europe. And Australia being as good as we are, we like to fo follow the trends as much as we can. And we've moved from our whipped cream dispenser ideas to the ballooning ideas and crackers you'll see a picture of in a moment as well. Um, here we go. Here's my picture of a cracker. I have one of these in my office. I didn't go to my office today because I was going to bring it in. Um, these are about the size of a cigarette lighter. Um, they fit the nitrous bowl um, inside and I've got a mouse or a pointer. Can I? Oh, yeah, there we go. Up in here. Whoop. I'm going to do this off screen. Up in here is a little piercing agent that, as you screw the cap on, the piercing agent goes into the top of the bowl, and then you put your balloon on top of these holes up here, and you fill up your balloon, right? And then you can squeeze your balloon tight. Now, don't use your kids' party balloons for this because they'll all pop. There's a lot, lot of pressure in the canister in there. So these are all the, the more expensive $2, $3, um, quite large balloons that they get when they sell them as these little packs. And you can buy this pack when you're over in, in UK online with a can, uh, box of 12 um, with a balloon, with the rubber band so it doesn't get away from you, all that sort of stuff. All, all sold, ready to go. Um, and in Australia, it's, it's still not illegal for these, um, so for catering companies, et cetera, to sell um, nitrous oxide in the canister styles. Um, and this is usually the type of box that they come in. Um, as you can see, when, when I was setting this up, we are talking about the European version because it's coming from the Global Drug Survey. But I think we're about 7 to $11 for a box, I think, something like that yeah, over here, um, for a box of 12. You can buy it online in boxes of 100 um, and we can get large canisters as well that we'll see shortly. So what is it? Well, um, basically when it's inhaled, you, um, it impacts your central nervous system. It sort of changes your mindset. Most people experience auditory ringing. So this is where the pinging noise comes from. You can feel quite lightheaded. Your head's a buzz. And it can last anywhere between a minute or two and four to five minutes, depending on how much you're doing. Um, I found this picture of the cat, and I sort of feel this is the way you get for about five minutes at tops, um, this sensation that's going on. Um, and then it just passes, and it washes away, as, as, as if you never had anything, and there's no negative side effects after the fact afterwards. Um, it's considered to have very few contraindications in the medical system, so it's considered a very safe drug. There's a lot of discussion, and this is where we get to it later on, about the harms um, from nitrous oxide related to vitamin B12 deficiencies and folate. Um, and when you have a B12 deficiency, you often start getting tremors and tingles at the perimeters, uh, the peripheries of your fingers and toes and your arms, and this is what we start to look at by extension. Um, there's 
considered very little harms because most of the time it's acutely used. Go back to the hospital setting or the um, den dentistry setting, it's put on for acute use. Once you're done, you moved on, there's nothing else going on. Um, the general effects, um, the gagging and coughing, these are all the things you might get listed if you, you know, get a negative response using Panadol, uh, but most of the time um, it's other than ringing in the ears and these sense of uh, audio spatial experiences for short times, nothing much goes on except for the end, this is what we're going to look at. So um, over the time, the, uh, I want to put a timeline of the history of nitrous oxide use in the recreational setting. Um, we basically started back in the nine, uh, early 1800s and we've gone through a series, so this up here was um, from uh, Blue Velvet where um, nitrous oxide was being used at the time, so I had a bit of media attention. Um, a lot of the European, these are all from England, some famous people who have been uh, associated with nitrous oxide use in the public space, got in trouble for it. I sort of go, oh, really, you're getting in trouble for that? Um, uh, there was an incident at the Guns N' Roses concert um, up in the end, uh, 2017. And then in Australia last year we had this one, all right? I don't know how many of you guys remember the story, but the young gentleman was supposedly had, having nitrous in his hotel room, walked out to the veranda and fell off the veranda. Um, and it was nine, ten storeys high or something. Um, now, this is where I start going, well, I don't think nitrous was the thing that killed him, but the use of nitrous left, led to this disorientation that had gone, gone on. Um, and it's more than likely if he was using ballooning at the time. We had this event about rebreathing. I'm going to talk about that. He basically got dizzy, uh, went to lean against the railing potentially, and lost his balance. Um, so, this, so it's not like this is a drug, again, that's going to kill you, but the effects of the drugs could have problems. So um, the research was done back in the early 1800s, and then we moved through that time sequence to understanding that um, this is one of the first letters in the 1970s that they realised in the public space, this is in a medical journal, that we're becoming aware of a problem of use um, that has great public social significance that our regular suppliers, um, I, I don't know if I have one of the can, oh, I might be coming up, of large medical canisters. And I'm talking this stuff, um, maybe the size of a um, scuba diving tank was getting stolen from hospital settings. I've had stories with friends who I know who have been with people who have stolen these from hospital settings and they get the tubes running off it and they just run basically the canister in the middle and have a party around this big canister with hoses coming off. You can imagine it like a um, keg for beer. Instead of running the beer, you're running your nitrous. Um, so this became why well, the medical system started realising we've got to do something about it um, and try to put in some uh, systems to stop it from occurring. As far as I know, I would imagine no Queensland Health Hospital Service has any true control over this. And if you're a smart person, you can go down to the regular um, gas refilling tank station. So I can't remember the acronym of these businesses where they I'll fill up your big tanks for nitrous for you because they have them in big tanks out the back for medical or for commercial purposes, not for home use. Um, so earliest academic reports, this is um, what I was talking to before. Here we are in 1978. They found a gentleman who was found dead in bed, fully clothed, lying on his back beside his bed was one of these large cylinders of nitrous oxide um, and a plastic tube that ran from the nose into the tank into the deceased person's mouth. So I'm not too sure if this guy was trying to overdose directly or something else occurred at the same time, but um, they were trying to basically link the two things together that this was his cause of death. Um, in 2014, over in Europe, um, the French coroner linked the association between nitrous ox oxide and death, but not being the um, direct kill, but certainly an accidental death due to nitrous use. Um, in the 1980s and onwards, it's become popular. Um, so I'm 50 this year. When I was around 18 years of age, I'd use nitrous. And I was asked for a show of hands, whoever's had a go, you don't have to put it up. I don't know if I'm in trouble for that declaration. I certainly don't feel bad. Um, 
But it was just one of those things that was very temporary and acute and we might have done it at 11 o'clock at night until we run out of our box of 12, right? And that's between four people, three canisters each. We're sharing, there was no one who was being greedy over the other one, but it, we moved on. But it seems to become more public and we're gonna slip, throw to a video that was um, taken from Channel 4 in the UK. Uh, I think it was just before the NPS laws came through of how um, predominant nitrous oxide is has become a business in the high streets of England. <laughs> balloons! <laughs> Laughing gas balloons, guys. Yeah. We go high, don't be shy. He's gone, he's dribbling. It's not designed to be inhaled, it's designed to whip cream. Balloons are the best. Huge numbers of people inhale nitrous oxide for the sole purpose of getting high. And nowhere more so than East London, where it's become big business for the balloon sellers. Inhaling nitrous oxide recreationally isn't anything new. But talk to anyone who went to carnival or festivals last summer, and he'll tell you there's been a huge spike in the amount of people doing balloons. When that was coming up, obviously I knew what was happening to me, so, so as I was letting it go, but I mean, as in, yeah, it's a good little higher. It's just a short buzz, isn't it? Yeah. Just How a long short buzz. Uh, say roughly 30 seconds to a minute, about that. Hundreds of thousands of canisters meant for whipped cream dispensers are legally imported into the UK every week over the internet. A 25p canister can fetch up to five pound per balloon. And for black balloons with their bespoke equipment, trained staff, and even mobile chip and pin machines, this has become a brand. What we sell is we sell a novelty item that actually promotes that you don't have to take MDMA, you don't have to take cocaine, you don't have to go outside out and drink until you don't remember how you get home. You can go out, you can have a balloon. If you do it safely and responsibly, it's a five minute buzz and it gets you excited and you can continue and have a great night. Everybody's got to make money either way. I don't think it's a bad way to make money because it's just you providing a service. It's like me selling a hot dog at the side of a road. It's illegal for balloon sellers to sell nitrous oxide while it's in a canister. But once it's been pierced and distributed into a balloon, it then becomes legal. For the police, it's a huge grey area, and they say they're pretty much powerless to act. There's no control who can sell it, where they sell it, other than there are offences to sell it to someone under the age of 18. It is an area of law that does need uh, looking at very closely. I mean, we talk about these um, legal highs. Um, they're not legal. Um, they are illegal, many of them. And this falls into that category. There's, there's been some recent legislation where some of those have been made illegal, and I would like to see nitrous oxide seriously considered for some of its own legislation. I was stopped by two police officers. They took half an hour to like realise that they didn't know what they could or couldn't do. Like they like, we can't take anything off you. We have to let you go because we don't know what to do. There's no regulations about this. In large doses, nitrous oxide can cause dizziness and make you unconscious by starving the body of oxygen. There have been a handful of deaths over the past few years associated with the abuse of it, although the drug experts I spoke to were not convinced that it could be any worse than abusing alcohol. Until it's been made illegal or legal or something's been said about it, for us it's completely okay. Earlier this year, the Home Office wrote to festival organisers encouraging them to ban the sale of nitrous oxide at their events. And even though they warned that inhaling it might kill, there's no sign of a government crackdown happening anytime soon. The clink of canisters and the whoosh of dispensers seems to be growing across the country. And the whipped cream salesmen are laughing all the way to the bank. So I couldn't catch it at myself as well as that story sells what's going on with nitrous. Um, a couple of points of interest, it was a couple of years old. Uh, about a month ago, I saw a tweet of a bar in Belarus who had their A-frame board out the front saying, a beer and two balloons for five euro at the bar, right? This is literally walking off the street and that's what they're selling over the bar to you. 
Um, to me, that sort of says, okay, opportunities are abound here. Hopefully they've got a nice big canister out the back, a couple of balloons, and again, for the most part, harmless unt until there's a new movement of how we do it, and this is around the balloons. And I'm gonna talk about that now with the Global Drug Survey. So everyone understand when you're doing a balloon, the idea is to decant the whipped cream dispenser. In my good old days, you'll go off the nozzle of that, maybe freeze your lips a bit because of the, the rap rapid gas coming out. Um, nowadays, decant it into a balloon and then breathe in out of the balloon. Now, what's going on as well is you're doing what they call rebreathing. So I'm gonna breathe in, take it all in, a bit like when you're inhaling big on a big joint, and then instead of letting it out, letting the smoke bloom away, I put it back inside the balloon, and then I rebreathe that in. So what's going on in here is I'm taking my carbon dioxide and beginning to starve myself of oxygen. Um, and this is where I think some of the greater harms, the injury harms are coming about because people are becoming faint, not necessarily from nitrous oxide itself, but also having the deoxygenation in their blood and beginning to become a bit faint from that. Falling over, if you put that on top of some alcohol or some top of some pills or whatever else is going on on that very occasion, you're at higher risk. So the Global Drug Survey, um, every, every year since 2012 now, between November and December, uh, we put out a Global Drug Survey which has up to 300 questions depending on the year you're going in. Uh, we cover almost, well, a couple of years ago we had 150 different substances we ask you about. Um, that's reduced last year to try to get more people to uh, uh, answer different questions. Um, we uh, have... 20 different languages now that it's presented in. The last, the, this year just gone, we were in 170 different countries where we had a respondent from. We have over 50 countries with more than 200 plus respondents. Some countries 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people. Um, so it's still going. Hopefully all you guys here promote it every year. Feel free to do it yourself. Um, always gets the numbers up. Um, so across the three years of data I'm going to use here where we particularly ask a lot of questions about nitrous oxide across 14, 15 and 16, we had um, between them almost uh, 300,000 people complete the survey and from those 300,000 people we ended up with about um, 20,000 people who had used nitrous oxide in the last 12 months. Um, Here's a breakdown, so that's 50,000 people of those 200,000 people have ever tried nitrous. So one in four of our respondents, this is respondents for drug use, have ever tried nitrous. And this just sort of demonstrates how prolific and probably how benign this drug is seen when it's used in the community. Um, nowadays, we've got about 20,000 people we had for these three years that this data I'm about to present is based on um, to look at the harms. And then that's in the last 12 months of use and we had about 7,000 who used it in the last 30 days across those three years. Um, and again, so this, we've still got new data that's come out now, we just haven't worried about extending the story because the story is an extension of the same work, except we look at different harms now. Um, so a bit of a breakdown on this 20,000 people. The differences in numbers that you'll see as it flips around is only a reduction in who answered what for other questions. So we've got nitrous use, not everyone did gave us the gender between men and women. We might have had some intersex and transgender here which has just been taken out for the moment or they didn't report their sex. So um, try to use my colour coding, being very um, uh, heteronormative here. I've got my pinks and my blues going on. Um, and we see out of the sample, most males um, were more likely to have used it. And as we can see here, it's a young person's drugs typically. Um, although. This still surprises me, this lovely tail end that if you're 40 or 50, maybe this year's celebration for my 50th birthday, I might go out, grab some canisters. Um, <laughs> the, you know, I don't know if I can say that again, it's still legal. Um, but this, this is one of those opportunities it can do. So it's, it's, it is definitely a young, young person's activity space, but it's not definitely left to those. Um, so this is the breakdown. It's no surprise from the Global Drug Survey that um, the European country representation here um, has high dose nitrous use in the last 12 months. And that's a real picture up in the top left hand corner of someone cleaning up their alleyway of the box of canisters that are being left there and everything's being dispensed. Um, and it's still going on today. Um, so 
Here, here's the methods uh, routes of administration. Ballooning is the most popular, then followed by canisters. And these are the crackers here. The bags, we actually have this in. So people will grab a home bag, basically seal it up with a rubber band and blow that up with gas and breathe it out. Um, sort of makes sense to me using a rubber balloon because the um, air proofing is better um, than using the bags, but it's an option. And then we had some people who have come up with other ways that we, did, we didn't have extra information about, but very rare. Um, most people use the canisters you buy from the 7-Eleven or from the catering shop. But this, this here is uh, police detection over in the US of the different canisters when they did a raid that were being used and they were different nitrous cans in the house that were being used. These are typically medical grade. That's one of the things to mention. There are three grades in nitrous. There's medical grade nitrous, so when you're having the babies, having the teeth, there is uh, food, uh, food based grade. This is the ones the little canisters are in. And then there's um, commercial for the um, vehicles. Um, they are, other than medical grade, the other two are degraded. So there's uh, good papers about um, impurities that are in with this. But I don't imagine these impurities, unless the volume is so large, would actually have other issues to deal with. It, you know, I don't know if things like leads or anything like that too much consumed, depending on what's in there. But still got to pass an FDA approval because it's food-based um, consumption. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, all right, dose, doses. Now, this is where we start leading into things, that it's dose per session, and we took a dose at any time as being a canister, right? So if you've got a medical grade, you know, 20 litre tank in your house because you're having a party, we, we can't measure what that dose is. We just take the doses per canister as uh, being the single canister use. And as you can see from this lovely slide, that it's not uncommon between one to five is your regular per session use of nitrous oxide. We're talking low end here. And if you think about your box, and you've got 12 in a box, you and your mate are doing it, that's six each. Three mates, that's four each. Four mates, that's three each. And that's it. You spent your 10 bucks, you're about to head out. Then what we see up here though, is that this very high end, right, of nitrous users, we can have people who's having a session of 100 canisters at a time. Right? And I, when I first was doing this back 2015, when I start, started looking into this, I actually thought this was a problem with our survey, having a higher end cap, that someone was just being a bit of a tosser at the time, going all the way to the bottom and clicking 100. So when I went out and started looking at the literature, and I showed you that report back in 1976, this is not uncommon, right? So there are people who think, hey, this is such a good time that I'll just use high dose of nitrous. And then you can start going, okay, what are the harms from here? Because this isn't what it was designed to do. So we asked a series of questions about the experiences you use, fainting, accidental injury, nausea, confusion, hallucinations, and this persistent numbness, right? My, my yellow neuropathy as being the, the exact medical expression we're looking here where we use persistent numbness or tingling um, being a representation of that. Um, we uh, become aware of other things like frost burn. Um, you can get sulfur dioxide in your nods for cars, so you don't want to be doing too much of that. I don't know anyone who has, who goes out and gets the car stuff, and while they're waiting for their race, they might have some themselves. I don't know if they do that. Um, but then your homemades. And there are some notions, of there, there's been reports about explosions, so when people try to crack their own canister, um, uh, Cameron and I were just talking about some police discussions that people are now putting um, nitrous into inhalant um, canisters when they go out. And in which, working through the idea here that if you actually could pierce the nitrous canister with the inhalant mechanism, you wouldn't be able to hold it because the gas, the compressed gas will fly the canister out the back end. That's why you need the crackers because it's all self-contained. Um, but you can have some injuries that way. This is all low-end injuries, injuries though. So I'm going to have a quick look here about the different uh, uh, response sets. Um, and I've shown you here a breakdown of all response data. And we see to the question of have you experienced fainting in the last 12 months, we had about uh, 1,000 people who said yes in the last 12 months, 1,000 people who said yes but not in the last 12 months, 1,700 people, 17,000 people not at all, and 811 who are going, I'm not answering that question. And so this works out 
if I just base this on, yes, in the last 12 months, and no as my denominator in this case, about 5% of people feel fainting when they go. And I'm not surprised, right? If you take nitrous oxide, you get a bit of buzz in your head, and you might feel a bit faint at the time, and it should pass. Accidental injury. We see here about 2%. This is getting close, and I reckon this number will now be increasing as more and more ballooning and rebreathing is going on, that these accidental injury numbers will occur. This is the falling over, banging your head, doing something wrong. You saw it in the video clip as I was going through, a few of these people um, falling to the ground or sitting down to the ground. And if you, you've been drinking at the same time, you're doing, the, doing some nitrous, you're increasing the risk of accidental injury. Uh, the nausea. This one gets up there. This is that sensation you might get from head spinning, ear ringing, a bit of visual and auditory hallucination going on. Start feeling a bit sick. Um, maybe added to that I just had a dozen beers at the same time when I think this is a good time to do it as well. It might set you off. All right, confusion. Also up there in the big numbers that we got, you know, 28%. Again, a con uh, probably a byproduct of using nitrous in the first place, but you're certainly disorientated for 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes. And if you've been doing this for 100 doses or you continue doing this, you, you've got to imagine the, the increase of confusion is getting up there. Hallucinations, again, high. This is non-descriptive non, um, of whether or not it's auditory or visual, but it's certainly one of the byproducts. That's what you're doing it for. Um, and now our persistent numbness. And this is where I'm, I'm really interested with the work we're doing, and this, there's some work here we're trying to get published at the moment. We had about 5% who are reporting now persistent two weeks after the fact of tingles in your fingers and tingles in your toes after having a good nitrous session. And we wanted to know, well, what is that nitrous session? So this is where we talk about the harms in particular, dose response curves that I'm fitting. If you're mathematically inclined, I've got a log log model down the bottom where I'm looking at this. If you're not mathematically inclined, my diagrams I'm gonna show you will help you answer the question. This is it, right? This is the fun graph, right? This is a dose response curve that basically says Number of doses. Now, because it's a log log graph, the log curve at the bottom is the 0, 1, 2, and the translation to number of doses is the number in the brackets. So that first number uh, with a log of 1, this is roughly two doses of nitrous. We have very low probability of, of reporting any ex, um, experiencing tingles. When we get up to 100 doses, this is in here, this is, well, I can't show it on there, but this is in this uh, section between four and five. You can see that curve has escalated quite high, right? The large uh, confidence band here is because not many people are doing 100 doses per session, and you can sort of see this starts breaking out at around that seven doses per session mark, you see the confidence band. But this curve is saying that once I'm doing 20, 30, 50, 100 doses per session, this persistent numbness is an experience that I'm, I'm exp having. Now, we're going to move into trying to get some understanding about B12 um, uh, reduction and whether or not that's what's causing some of this. Um, but we, this curve here, now these numbers are small, right, in terms of likelihood of experiencing the outcome. These are probability numbers over here. So that, this is, at 1%, right? So this is a low number. So the, these harms aren't harms that are going to change the world, but they certainly are harms that we need to be aware of that people are experiencing. And the higher dosing you're taking, the more likely it is that you're going to be experiencing these harms. Um, across the countries, we see here that those in Germany and the European areas, the so Germany and Netherlands, that's the top two lines there, um, are more likely to be reporting these high doses. So we're all, almost at 2% here for the German group in the high doses than um, the rest of the uh, countries down below. Um, so we're seeing a clear usage issue going on here that may or may not be based on other activities at the same time when you're going out and using nitrous. So wrap up, things to consider. In the most part, I actually see nitrous oxide as a harmless drug, right? Um, a substance that you can use, which is, for most parts, being benign. But we're seeing a surge. We're seeing a surge here 
in Queensland. With, uh, when I first did this in 2015, I was talking to some friends in New South Wales and they were going, oh yeah, it's all happening down on the high streets now as well around King's Cross and all this sort of stuff. The bulbs are coming out, the balloons are out. What are we going to do about it? I said, I don't know if you need to do anything about it yet, but I'm really interested to see that what was in Europe has certainly come here and it's still here, right? I'm talking about the park before and it's still going on. Um, we're, we're uh, trying to understand better the links between nitrous oxide for rec recreational use and the persist persistent numbness. We're trying to understand better the sex differences, right? So, um, and whether or not there's uh, a further impact for this going on that, again, 100 doses is a lot. The money going out on 100 doses alone, right? If it's 10 bucks for 12, let's write it to 10, that's $100 I'm spending for 100 canisters. I can spend that money for other drugs better, right? My return on investment here. I still, I get mind blown how this is a choice that's going on. That's a lot of money being spent um, for very short return risk, uh, short return effect. Um, the clubbing status, the high end, we, we're seeing it occur, but there's not enough to demonstrate uh, difference in the relationships. Um, I do have other data that does show age effects. Again, this might be this deterioration of the myelin sheath that may be playing out for the older people. Roots of administration, we didn't see anything clear in the source, uh, which makes sense. So for most people, a bulb or medical canister should be the same because for the end part, nitrous is nitrous. And that's me. That's time. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, now People online, type your questions now, but I might go to the room first here by Alan and see, do we have any questions for Jason? Yes. So um, back in the early 70s, uh, the B12 link was when it was first being presented um, and it, it was um, more around women and the folate issues and stuff like that going on. I would imagine um, it's the t uh, dual toxicities, exactly. It's, n it's not just nitrous outright, but it's the other substances you're taking at the same time. It might be high volume, so you are taking the alcohol, you are taking the nitrous, you might have taken some pills, and this is all exacerbating. It's just, for most of us, the reason why we won't be seeing it is you only do one, two, three canisters. So you, you gotta, you're getting up there at 50 and 100 canisters a session. You know, this is, these are large numbers, let alone, you know, I, I don't know what bin it goes into. Is this a yellow bin thing or a red bin thing? Uh, it's just, what do you do with all these? But I, I do, I would believe that alcohol is certainly a mix. Um, it'll be very hard to distinguish here because I very much doubt that we have nitrous oxide only users in the community. Uh, this is the only drug that I use. I, I find that hard to disentangle those. Next question. So, um, particularly with the ones that are having like 50 and 100, has there been any evidence of any neuroreduction or anything with like younger people using it? Is there any structural changes? Um, great question. Um, I think that question needs a lab to play it out. Um, the problem is, I probably, usually I like this context here. Um, until the Global Drug Survey came along with such a great volume of people to talk about their usage and associated harms, the only way we know anything else about nitrous oxide is based on focus groups of 20 and 30 people. And that's it. That's the information that's out there about the harms for nitrous. And none of this is lab based as well. So can we do an MRI to see what's going on? How long have you been using it for? So this very first markers for dose response against all harm. So we can do it against all the fainting and um, uh, confusion and the other ones is the first place to have the volume, 20,000 nitrous users sitting together in one room and looking at their effects. But I imagine if we could get um, uh, uh, an ethics approval to say I want to dose people with nitrous and then get them on an MRI bed to see what's going on, there are lots of people out there who'd be interested in seeing what that effect was. Uh, we've got a, there's a couple of questions online which are actually a bit similar, so I'll merge them. Um, do we know what the long-term effects of nitrous use might, might be, obviously aside from the personal use? Yeah. Um, no. 
I don't think we do. I think there might be some medical case studies um, of these people who have actually tried to link it to B12 deficiencies. Um, but the global drug surveys, uh, most people who, use the who have done the global drug survey um, come back and do it again. Um, so it's one of those things that we could certainly extend the questions to understand how long have you been using it for, or is, uh, like you're gonna age out, and you're gonna age out young for most of this. Again, the economy will tell you, if I can go out and get some ecstasy at 20 bucks, or go out and get five containers for 50, which way am I gonna go for my nighttime fun? Um, but the, um, the long-term effects, I guess no one's even worried about the question because it's always been purpose-built for being short-term. It's pain relief for dentistry and it's pain relief for pregnancy and it's for making my cake at a birthday. Um, the, so the idea now of long-term effects of using this is probably a very valid question that needs exploration. Right, yeah. um, any more questions from the room before we wrap up today? Looks like we're all good. All right, uh, thank you very much, Jason Ferris. Thank you. Um, those online, please do a little survey. And uh, don't join us next week because we're going to be on holidays for a couple of weeks. Uh, their next seminar is on the 1st of May with uh, Heidi Sturk doing digital mental health in practice. So uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you very much. Thank you.